never once have we called on you and you simply said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. But you always show up. You're right on time. And I thank you for that. For your goodness, your power. You are our everything. I love you so much. I love you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Don't you, uh, I'll just take a few minutes. Shake somebody's hand. You don't know who they are, say this. Who are you? <laughs> it works every time. Come on, find somebody, shake your hand, let them know you're glad to have them this morning. Come on, get this.
Now you can have a lot of things, but if you don't have him, you're in a mess. Would you agree with that? You got a lot of faith, but if you don't have him, you're in a mess. Amen. Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to come with your tithe and your offerings today. Let me just say to our visitors, we do have visitors here today that when service is over with, uh, if you'd like to come right up here to the front, we've got some coffee cups with our names on them. New beginnings, we'd like to give one of those to you. Just, just, just a little token of simply saying that we're glad that you visit us with us today. Also, if you're brand new here today, uh, unless the Lord speaks to your heart, I'm not going to overrule Him, but if He uh, speaks to your heart and says He wants you to give something, fine. If not, we'd rather you keep your money in your pocket today and let us take you out to eat, okay? Uh, I, I really would rather you leave saying, I can't believe that the preacher told me not to give today. That'll blow their minds, you know. And so, uh, but you home folk, you home folk that are here, we need your help. And uh, not only we need your help, but you need God's help. And when you give, the Bible says, shall we give it to you? Good measure, press down, shake together, and running over. I love the running over part. <laughs> Amen. Father, thank you for this time that you have given to us to come to this place to be able to worship you freely. We still live in a place called America where we are free to worship you. So we do that this morning. We do it in song. We do it in fellowship. We do it in word. And now we're going to do it in giving. We're going to worship you with our gifts. We love you. We appreciate you. Bless those that come now. Bless them now. And bless them good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For all of our visitors and for those that have been around a long time, we don't come and get it. We ask you to come and find it. God bless you as you come today.
Well, my grandpa, he was one tough cookie. My grandpa was a wrestler. When they would come to town, they would have these sporting events. They had like a circus or whatever that would come. And the circus always had their strong man. So they'd come to town, they'd set up a ring, and they would ask the guy in the local town that was the strongest or the, or the, the, the giftest, whatever you want to call him, if they could take the strong man. My grandpa was the guy that would get in the ring and make the guys cry. I mean, he, that was him. He was my hero. I love that guy. He could whip about anybody. I made a mistake when I used to think I could box. One day I walked up to my grandpa, so help me God, true story. I walked up to my grandpa, T.G. Lewis, and I said, Oh, Grandpa, come on, come on. Now we're going to get him. He's an old man. Come on, Grandpa, come on, man. Come on, come on, come on. And before I could blink, he hit me on this side of the face. Someone said, Do you ever do that again? I said, Are You a fool? <laughs> Never did I do that again. But I did that piece here, Bill, and we go down the side of the road on this particular town. And I moved my grandpa on the other side, there would be somebody walking. And I knew what I wanted to do. I was going to shoot him. I was going to shoot him. But he was bigger than I was, so I looked at my grandpa and I'd say, Can you whip him? <laughs> and grandpa would tell me one of two things. Number one, shoot him. <laughs> now, when my grandpa said shoot him, there was nothing holding me back. Because I didn't care how big the dude was, I knew he had to go through grandpa before he got me. Number one, I didn't think he could go through grandpa. And number two, I knew this, grandpa could at least hold him up long enough to where I could get away. <laughs> but there's nothing that grandpa said once in a while. Keep the pee and the pee shooter. And let's keep on walking. <laughs> See, as long as you know somebody is there to protect you, you can do all right. He said, you didn't choose me, remember I chose you. My dad and our cell group Friday night, he said about that I hadn't thought about it, I thought it was really cool. I said, how does it make everybody feel? And he said, surprise. <laughs> well, I like that one. Surprise that he actually chose me. I can see him choosing you, you're good looking. I can see him choosing you, you're talented. But choosing me? What are you, desperate, God? <laughs> Uh, you didn't choose me, remember I chose you. And I put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't be spoiled, as fruit bears. Whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives it to you. But remember, now you got to get this, remember the root command, love one another. Say that, say love one another. Love one another. Say, repeat this after me. That means, that means I got to love everybody. You know what I mean, I don't like it. If you find the godless world has hated you, remember, it got to start hating me. Thank you, God. If you lived on the world's terms, the world would love you as its own. But since I picked you, and you live on God's terms, and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. When that happens, remember this. Servants don't get better treatment than the masters. What he's saying is this. They hated me, they're going to hate you. If they picked on me, they're going to pick on you. If they beat on me, they will certainly beat on you. This is encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> if they did what I told them, then they would, they would do what you tell them. They are going to do all things to you because of the way they treated me. They don't know the one who sent me. If I hadn't told them in plain language, it wouldn't have been so bad. As it is, they have no excuse. Hate me, you hate my father. It's all the same. If I hadn't done what I'd done among them, works no one had ever done, they wouldn't be to blame. But they saw God's signs, and they hated anyway, both me and the Father. Interesting. They have verified the truth of their own scriptures, where it is written, they hated me for no good reason. When the friend I plan to send, the Holy Spirit, when the friend I plan to send to you from the Father comes, the Spirit of truth issuing from the Father, he will confirm everything about me. You too, from your side, must give your confirming evidence since you are in this with me from the start. Chapter 16. Hmm. I told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. Again, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> At least he's saying you're going to get killed. Hallelujah. <laughs> I told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. They are going to throw you out of many places. They're even going to, there's even going to come a time when anyone who kills you 
will think he's doing God a favor. They will do these things because they never really understood the Father. I told you these things so that when the time comes and they start in on you, you'll be well warned and ready for them. I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day. But now on my way to the one who sent me, not one of you have asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you become. So let me say it again. The truth, it's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the friend, the Holy Spirit, won't come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Don't look to be so popular. If you are a Christ follower. Before we pray, let me read this to you. I thought this was interesting. A, a, a trio of old veterans were bragging about the heroic exploits of their ancestors one afternoon down at the BFW Hall. My great-grandfather, age 13, one declared proudly was a drummer boy at Shadow Hill. Mine boasted another went down with Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. A third veteran said, I'm the only soldier in my family. But if my great-grandfather was alive today, he'd be the most famous man in the world. Really? Why? The friends wanted to know. And the man replied, because if he was alive today, he would be 165 years old. <laughs> How many ever wish you could pop him? The answer is all of you, you still want to admit it. I understand that. I remember the high school days, some of you remember those. Uh, I remember the high school days when you dressed a certain way, you acted a certain way, you put your hair a certain way. This last week, my son, he's so kind to me, Jeremiah, he walked up to me and said, hey, I seen that old picture of you when you were a kid. I said, yeah. He said, your hair, boy, it sure was funny, guys. <laughs> I had to remind him that back in those days, it was cool to wear hair like that. It was long, and it looked good. I mean, you dressed, you dressed wild back then. How many guys remember all the polyester stuff? How many guys remember those? We, we wear those lapels, and we wear them on the outside, and they were like this long. You guys remember that? All polyester. How about leisure suits? Woo! How about bell bottoms? Bell bottoms. And the bigger the bell, the better. Remember that? And if you had somebody that would do it, you actually would cut out pieces of the bell bottom on the sides, add material to it to make the bell bigger. And then you would walk through the water and get the bottom of the wet so that when you walk, man, everybody heard you cut. It was cool. You know, we, we make fun of a lot of girls nowadays because of their, their pants. They're very tight, you know. And, and, and I'll make a comment like, let me paint them on today. Let me tell you something. In the 70s, we painted them on. <laughs> no, it's not a good visual. I understand. <laughs> we want to be accepted. We want to be the in crowd. If you have a talent, then you bust it loose. Back then, it was Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Fever. It was, it was disco, baby. <laughs> Ain't no bump and grind. It was the disco lights. Boom, boom, boom. They were everywhere. Some of you don't remember that. Some of you do. As I look out here today, I see that most of us made it through those high school years rather, well, unscathed. Most of us really desire to be mocked. We desire to be on top. If you don't really think you do, why don't you let me ask you a couple questions. Have you ever been up for an award? You were nominated for a particular award. And they started calling out the names. Did you or did you not? You don't have to answer it. Did you or did you not secretly hope they were going to call your name? When they didn't, you just, uh, no big deal, but on the inside, you're going, that's not a big name. <laughs> have you ever attended a social event where you wish the people actually wanted to be with you? How about this one? Have you ever went to a social event and wanted people to say, that's my friend to you, instead of you saying, oh yeah, I know them, they're my friend. Or just once, wouldn't you like to be the guy to hit the game winning home run? <laughs> wouldn't you like to be the woman that records a smash hit single? I mean, all of us at one time or another, we like being on top. We like feeling appreciated. Some of you guys even like to be adored. <laughs> I tell Lisa that all the time. Adore me. No, I, and she does. I'm, I'm adored. 
So anyway, Jesus, Jesus addresses the situation that we're talking about. He addresses the situation of popularity. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to pray first, and we're going to get down and do some work. All right? Here we go. Father, first of all, thank you for this time that you've given us. I just simply ask you one with us today. Thank you, Lord, for what Lisa has done in presenting the gospel for music today. Brought us to the throne of God. Now simply I ask you, O oh God, to be with me as I deliver to your people your word. Help me do what I need to do, say what I need to say, in order that your word may change lives today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 First thing that Jesus talks about is he, he makes a statement and he says, Don't be surprised by persecution. And write something down, write that down. Don't be surprised at persecution. If you follow Christ, there are people that are not going to like you. Christians must expect persecution from a world that hates us. Now here's what you really have to understand. Don't take that so personal. It's not that they hate you. It's that they hate the one that you represent. We'll get into that in a little bit longer, a little bit more. John chapter 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Our need, now you've got to get this, our need for love and acceptance will not be met by an unbelieving world. Let me say it again. Our need for love and acceptance will not be met by an unbelieving world. That love and that acceptance is going to be met by the body of Christ, by you. You're the ones that are supposed to look at somebody and lift them up. You're the one that's supposed to look at somebody and encourage them. You're the one that's supposed to look at somebody and say, hey, you're doing good, aren't you? And if you're not, I want to pray for you. And I believe that together we can get a hold of the hand of God and he will bring us home. Christians 
walk in the light, we expose the darkness and the dark deeds of men. It's as if God is in you. Now, it's not important. He's not in you. You're living according to the Word of God. He is in you. There is a light in you. So when you walk into a room full of darkness where junk is going on, I'm telling you, immediately they will have something against you. But here's what you have to understand. Again, it's not personal because they don't have something against you. Here, Ramon. They don't have something against you. Here, Ramon is. I'm a dark guy. I'm messed up. Ramon walks into the room where I'm at. Here, Ramon. He walks in and immediately, spiritually, you gotta understand this, spiritually, immediately the light that is in him starts to open up my eyes to the darkness that I am in. So what am I going to do? Am I going to get mad at God? No. I can't beat God up. And sometimes I may not even know who God is. So I'm not mad at God. And if I'm not mad at God, I'm certainly not mad at His Son. And if I'm not mad at His Son, I'm certainly not mad at the Holy Spirit. Who am I mad at? I'm mad at the guy that I can see in front of me who is causing me to feel bad. Amen. Are you, are you listening to this? Right. I'm trying to help you understand. There are people right now that are treating you bad. But it's not you that they don't like. It is the spirit of Christ that is on the inside of you. And the light is coming out. Now, here's what will happen. For some, we will run from the light. It makes me feel bad. It's not like God's, God's trying to condemn you. It's just that the light is shining the darkness. I will come to a point sooner or later. This is what you need to hear, Christians. I will come to a point sooner or later where I say, man, I don't like what I'm doing anymore. I don't understand why I'm doing it. I've got to get out of this kind of life. What am I going to do? The light comes on. Wait a minute. Ramon. And I'll go back to Ramon. And I say to him, because the light has been shining out of him, I say to him, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you have. I don't understand it, but I do know this. There is something about you I have never felt before. I want what you got. Now it allows him who has the light of Jesus in him to share what the light mm, That's good preaching. Get it. And there are people in this 
him, they won't get in. <laughs>
time said, open your mouth. <laughs> Never one time. This guy who lived in California, he just got to say, boy, he was, he was a, uh, he's old enough to know better. And um, make sure I get this back to you because I sell a bunch of tickets. <laughs> He's in Ray, California, and he just got to say, he's just going to save the whole world. The uh, Shasta, I think it's called Shasta Mall there. He goes outside, and outside there's a, a brick block, whatever it is, like race deal. <coughs> he gets on top of it, and here's what he does. You're on!
Just make sure your popularity is in the right land. See if I'm popular there. Let me tell you something happening there. Just, just stay right there where you're at. And, and, and there really is a point to this. I'm at Applebee's the other day, right? I go in, uh, I think it's Wednesday night, I go in our church. And uh, Alan Cruz, not here today, I'm not sure where's at, Alan Cruz. Um, he's a bartender at uh, Applebee's. Fine cup on our cups. That's where he works. When I walked in, he's standing bar and he waves at me. Pastor! Alan! I mean, we just did that all over town. He <laughs> <laughs> would like it or not like it. <laughs> and uh, so I go over and I'm talking to Alan, and he's talking to a couple that's sitting right in front of him. I don't know if they're married or not, I have no idea. I don't know if it's husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, but she's pregnant. And I said, hey, you're about to have a baby. When's it when's the baby due? And she said, oh, yesterday, today, tomorrow, just quickly. And I, so I told her, I said, you know, I remember my wife being at this position. And I remember when, when she was saying, oh, God, just give him my hand. <laughs> you know? And so I'm talking to him. We're just having a conversation. And so I'm about to leave. I'm about to turn around and tell him Alan goodbye. And I leave. I felt like the Lord said, well, I, 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 I'm not getting it. Randy, <whistles> hey, hey. I put an opportunity in front of you. You walk away from it. Ooh, excuse me. Employer. <laughs> <laughs> turn around. I go back. I put my hands on the kid's shoulders. And I said, hey, I know you already know it. I'm Alan's pastor. If you don't mind, you're about to have a baby. I like to pray for you. Now they both giggled. Now it wasn't giggle like I can't believe what you're doing. It was kind of a little embarrassment, in fact. And so I put my arms on the shoulder and I started praying. You know what they did? Because <laughs> <laughs> at that point, they're needing all the help they get. <laughs> I started praying for them. And when I'm done, I just simply say it. I said, I love kids. I believe in you. Preacher, what's the point? Here's the point. It's been real easy to protect my popularity. Because before that prayer, Alan was there going, he's my pastor. The couple was there saying, well, it's cool. Your pastor come on tell to you. But now, I've crossed the line. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, I, I'm saying, I think we're going to do what maybe something else would because my popularity is not near as important to me here as it is in heaven. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. I believe with all my heart when I put my hands on their shoulders and I begin to pray for them. This is what I believe. You know what I believe this, James? This is what I believe. I believe God said, Heaven!
repeat this after me. Say, Father. Father. Jeremiah, come here, please. You don't need to read that. <laughs> say it again. Say, Father. Father. I give to you. I give to you. My everything. My everything. I am not concerned any longer. I am not concerned any longer. With worldly popularity. With worldly popularity. I want to be popular. So I give to you my everything. Help me, God, this week. Touch the untouchable. Love the unlovable. Reach the unreachable. Do the undoable. In Jesus' name. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. You know. Everybody said, hey.